Hello, everybody. I hope you can see and hear us uh, reasonably well. Welcome to our Spain for Indies Masterclass. Uh, as you can see, we're doing it on a platform called Blackboard rather than Zoom, which probably you're more familiar with. Technology is pretty much the same, uh, just slightly uh, configured differently in a, in a few ways. The most important thing to point out is that the chat function, which is something we encourage you to use, is situated in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. So you, you should see a little purple tab there. If you click on that, you can open up the chat and you can see that there's the uh, facility there just to make comments as well. And we, we do encourage that. Um, we're going to make this as much an interactive thing as we possibly can. Uh, and that means that if you'd like a wine or you've got any comments at all about a wine, please feel free to, to type something into that little box there. It doesn't have to be very long. Just tell us that you've enjoyed a wine if that's all uh, you want to say about it. But it'd be nice to kind of get a bit of dialogue going and, and David is on, of course. On course, of course, available to answer any questions. So this masterclass is part of Wines from Spain's annual tasting 2021 digital events program that's been put together. And this particular masterclass is the third in a series of six. There are some more coming up, including a Temper Tempranillo masterclass with Tim Atkin and a focus on sustainable uh, Spain, which is hosted by Jamie Good. And Wines from Spain has also been running two digital tastings uh, giving the UK trade the opportunity to taste wines uh, in the comfort of their own home or workspace. Sample packs of mini bottles from those tastings are being sent to everybody who signs up. Uh, and this activity is remaining open for another couple of weeks, so you've still got time to get on board. So we really encourage you to do that. For either of those things, for the masterclasses or to take past, part in the uh, tastings, you need to go to foodswinesfromspain.com. So there's an S in both of those words, foodswinesfromspain.com. Right, so after we finish this, we'll run exactly to time. It won't, won't take up more than an hour of your time. After an hour, um, we'll, we'll wrap up. Everyone will be sent a copy of the video so that if you've missed anything or you want to go back on anything or you just want to share it with some other people, you're very welcome to do that. Another thing we should point out as we go along, you'll see in your uh, little miniatures that have come, you've got the, the QR code on there. And really encourage you to scan those bottles because what happens when you do that, you bring up a, a very convenient uh, tasting sheet about each one of those wines, including what the label looks like, including the RRP, including the importer for the four wines there that have UK importers and details about the producers from the other two. So it's a really clever system. It allows you to make your own notes as well if you want to do that on, on the platform. Um, so it's a nice little um, touch that's been included with this particular tasting. Um, so that's really it from me. What we're going to do as we go along, David will introduce the, the, the wines and talk a little bit about them, and that's your chance to jump in with questions and comments. But I'm going to hand over to, to David now. David is, a, as you probably know, a Spanish wine lover. He's a Spanish wine expert, even a Spanish res resident for the time being, but not for much longer, and he's lived there all years now. So, David, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you. Am I there? Yeah. Cool. Okay, hello, hello everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been, um, my name is David Williams and thanks Graham for introducing me. Yes, I'm, um, I've been in Spain in, well in Catalonia more precisely for about eight years now. Um, and I think the thing that I've, one thing that I've noticed since I've been here and certainly something I didn't appreciate before I got here was the, was the sheer diversity of this country. So the kind of the, the pronounced regional differences. So, I think there is sometimes a tendency, certainly I had it before I came here, to think of Spain as a kind of monolithic single place with it's just a single kind of wine culture, or one that's kind of very dominated by uh, Rioja, for example, or, or Jerez, or Sherry. But actually, one thing I've noticed here is how different the regions are. So traveling around, as I've done quite a lot, um, you know, the difference between, for example, Andalusia, down in the south with all the cultural cues that you can think of there from flamenco to, to sherry and tapas to, to Galicia in the, in the northwest is, is an enormous uh, difference. It's a, it, these, these places are very different and they have their own very strong cultural traditions. Um, and I think the story of Spanish wine in the past 20 years has been about um, kind, of, kind of rediscovering a pride in those local traditions and different, different producers uh, discovering and, and feeling a pride for their own terroirs, their own grape varieties, and really starting to make wines that reflect them and express them. So 
this isn't just, um, by the way, I think one of the interesting trends in Spanish wine, it's, it's not just um, people from those regions working in their own regions. There's a, an interesting, although they're, they're very important, there's an interesting trend too in Spain to have um, some of the best winemakers make interesting wines that really reflect different places. So, for example, I'm thinking of someone like Alvaro Palacios, who works in Priorat, probably most famously, but it has Rioja Oriental, or Bierzo up in uh, León in the, in the northwest. Or you've got the four youngish uh, winemakers behind Envinate, who, do, who work in Tenerife, in Ribera Sacra in Galicia, in Extremadura, near the border with Portugal, to, to more in the south um, west of the country. Or someone like Telmo Rodriguez, who, who described himself in the time of flying winemakers as the original driving winemaker. And even today, uh, since he's been working for about 30 years, I guess, he has, been, you know, has his own operations, really, in Rioja, in Val de Oras, in Galicia, in Malaga, in Ribera de Duero, you name it. And it's not just the kind of small producers either. It's like the bigger, some of the bigger operations also have this kind of ability to make interesting wines that have a sense of place in many different places. So someone as simple as Torres, for example, which is working well in its traditional Penedes home, but also has operations in Priorat, in, in Rioja, in Rebel de Duero. So at the same time as this kind of uh, movement of uh, small producers rediscovering small places, uh, local grape varieties, and coming out of the shadow of the big boys a little bit, I think also we've had an appreciation that some of the traditional classical uh, ways uh, are, are equally interesting and have as much to say. So I think there's been a, a reappraisal, for example, of traditional methods of sherry or Rioja. Um, and I think that's been really interesting. So these, these two trends have kind of worked together. And I think in a region like Rioja or Sherry, you've got the two, the two currents coming together in a very satisfying way, which we'll explore towards the end of the tasting. But I suppose my idea to, for today's wines, for the pick behind the wines, is to try and find a way of kind of doing a little tour of Spain, modern Spain, which takes in all those new currents and old currents in or as much as is possible with, with just six wines. So we're going to start the tour, if you like, in what is Europe's most southerly wine region, um, so the Canary Islands. And I guess um, it is Europe, it's part of Spain, but I mean, geographically speaking, I suppose, given that we're only about 60, 70 miles away from the coast of Morocco in the southeastern uh, kind of limits of the, uh, um, of the archipelago of the Canaries, um, we're actually kind of in a kind of African climate. Now, in, in a, I suppose in an alternative timeline, the wines of the Canary Islands would, I suppose, be as famous today as, say, Madeira. Um, I mean, certainly in the 15th and 16th century, we're looking at a region that was uh, very popular in Britain. I mean, incredible. I, I, I found a statistic. There was about four and a half million litres of wine coming into the UK from Tenerife alone in the, in the kind of the height of the 16th century. And this is for Canary Island Sack, which was a wine mentioned in Shakespeare and other places. Um, basically, that kind of faded away. Britain, England rather kind of sided with Portugal, started to pick up its wines from Madeira instead. And I think that's created an interesting historical situation which has had a big effect on the wines today. So in the Canary Islands, you've had a, a tradition which has almost been left to kind of continue on its own. Um, you know, it's, it's been isolated. So you didn't get phylloxera, for example. So you've got very old vines. Um, you've got very different or a very unusual mix of grape varieties. Um, so, you know, you've got a very, you know, it's not, not a mix you'd find anywhere else. You've got things like Listan Negro, Listan Blanco, uh, Tinta Negromoli, the, the, uh, um, the Madeira grape, which is known there as Negromoli. Uh, you've also got a bunch of Portuguese varieties like Alfrochero. You've got Trousseau from the Jura. Um, Bicariego Negro, which is... Uh, uh, Catalonian grape actually called Samoy originally was the same thing. Anyway, it's a very unusual bunch and collection of grape varieties. But the wine I chose to show to show off the Canary Islands today is made from the wine, the variety that was um, the variety that was uh, but kind of behind that original uh, the original grape wines of the Canary Islands, the Canary Islands sack of the of the 15th and 16th century. So um, El Grifo. 
is the, the winery behind it, and Malva, Malvasia is that grape variety. So um, El Grifo does make, it makes quite a few wines, and one of the wines it makes is a kind of wine that harks back to the original um, sack wine. So it's kind of like, a, it's a blend of three different vintages, and which are from the 50s, 70s, and 90s. Uh, the grapes are dried on mats in the sun, um, and it's a fortified wine with the fermentation stops at 90 grams of sugar a litre, and then it's oxidative ageing. So it's a fascinating wine if we can get your hands on it. But this one is uh, representative more of the kind of modern trends in, in the Canary Islands more generally, and more particularly in Lanzarote. Um, so it's grown, I mean, Lanzarote as, as a kind of vineyard is absolutely uh, unique, a um, um, very unusual place. So you've got this, I don't know if any of you have been there, um, but or even seen photos, but the, the vineyards are covered by this kind of black pecan volcanic ash. There's huge, just everywhere is covered with this black ash. And the vines themselves are kind of buried into that ash and into these pits, like bush vines. And then they're surrounded by these little semicircular stone walls. Um, the, the purpose is because this is a very uh, humid, hot, tropical area, but the vineyards tend to be planted at a higher altitude, which allows, which allows some sort of balance to those um, which aren't particularly, those hot humidity, hot humidity, tropical climate isn't, um, isn't necessarily what you would think would be suitable for, for wine grapes. And so the altitude certainly helps to moderate that. And you've got, you've got a lot of um, trade winds coming in and those, those little stone walls are there to protect the, the grapes and the, the vines from those winds. Okay, so looking at this, uh, the wine itself, we might as well give it a taste, I think. So it's um, sourced from, it's, they say 300 growers from 600 sites. So we're really talking micro, <laughs> micro uh, uh, plots here. And it's just, a, it's just a really lovely, fresh style of wine. It's, it's quite high acidity, nice and dry. Hmm. But lovely racy style. I think I think you know you can get wilder, more kind of exotic, I suppose, wines from from the Canary Islands and from Lanzarote. But I like what I like about this is it's a kind of a, it's an introduction to that kind of um, very kind of um, nervy acidity um, that that the, the, that you find in the Canary Islands, and which is what I love about the wines there. It's the, as someone, as Natasha, thank you, has said, is it's a racy acidity. And it's, that's what really is the beauty in this wine, I think, and, it, and in the Canary Islands generally. So, yeah, I, I'm, I, I think that's a really lovely introduction to the style. I didn't quite, Graham, did you catch the retail price on this? I haven't quite. It's, it's well, the Xcella price is 785 euros. So I don't so think this one's important, is it? No. So, that would, so what does that clock in, and Mr. Retail Expert? <laughs> what would that be of, uh, on the shelf? I'll, 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 I think I'll leave some of our in, importing independents to work out the maths on that one. I know people have got <laughs> different variations on, on how that equation works. Mm. But I'd be lovely, lovely to see that come in if I, I do hope somebody would like to pick that up. But I think, I mean, it sounds to me, on, on paper at least, that that would be a good, quite a good value wine, actually. Um, I think we've had that in the, um, the Wine Merchant Top 100 in the past, haven't we? So I guess it must have had a UK importer at some point. So you think you're right. Yes, I think we mm. have, yeah. Certainly yeah. as an entrant, I'm not sure how it did, but yeah, we've certainly seen it before. No, it's really, it's an excellent introduction. I mean, obviously, and, um, sorry, go, yeah. It's just, it's just amazing how much freshness you get, as you say, for something so southerly, and pretty much African, really. Um, mm. yeah, and it's, it's got to be to do with those, those winds and the, and the way that they, they manage to keep that temperature moderated, because it's, you, in a blind tasting, I don't think you'd guess it, that was the latitude at all, would you? No, not at all. And the other thing, which I, which I was going to say, I don't know if I said, is that just the sheer age of the vines helps too. So, I mean, because of that absence of phylloxera, um, I think, oh, cool. Oh, God, okay, excellent. Yeah, um, yeah that's okay. Uh, yeah, so the age of the vines, so we, we, and it's not unusual to find 200-year-old vines, and certainly 19th century vines are in this blend. So it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing, really. And, and, and as we all know, old vines are great for balance. Excellent. Something like 17 quid. That seems reasonable to me, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to go 
to almost like the other extreme, really, um, of the country. Um, but still, you know, we're still talking about Atlantic influence, but we're right up in the northwest of Spain, above the border with Portugal. So we're in Galicia. Now, of course, Galicia has earned its stripes, really, in recent years, um, thanks to one of the big hits of modern wine, which is Albarino from Rias Baixas. Um, and then more recently, they've added things, I mean, at least in the UK, from inland appellations such as El Valde Oras and Monterrey, which do superb things with Godeo, amongst other things, of course, and other whites. Um, and then, of course, you've got the brilliant wines of Ribera Sacra, um, red and white, but I partic I'm particularly fond of the reds, which have that wonderful quality. I always think they're a little bit like a Spanish version of uh, Loire Cabernet Franc or possibly Cru Beaujolais or certainly something Eastern French um, but with, uh, from the Mencia, largely from the Mencia variety. So all those, that cluster of really interesting uh, wines from interesting grape varieties. Again, we're talking about a completely different wine culture, a completely, you know, one that's kind of almost its own thing. And one that certainly has more in common with, I think, with Portugal than the rest of Spain. Um, and I think that's especially true, perhaps even most true, of the, 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 the DO that we're going to be looking at here in our next wine, which is Ribeiro. Now, Ribeiro, living in Spain, and certainly in Catalonia, when I go into the supermarket here to, to go to buy, to buy a bottle of wine, and I don't have very much money, and I want to have a, a kind of fresh, effective, slightly floral, uh, dry white wine, then Ribeiro is often the place I go because it's a little bit still undervalued, I think. And you can pick up perfectly drinkable, if not amazing or remarkable, perfectly drinkable dry white wine for about four or five euros. Um, that reputation is beginning to change, though. And I think um, what we're seeing now in Ribeiro is over the past 10, 15 years, I'd say, is some really fascinating wines being made and I think it's it's instructed to think of it in a similar way to uh, the Vino Verde really where we've had a similar change where you've had these serious winemakers come in and really make the most of the the terroir the the, the local grape varieties and just really start to pr produce wine on a much more kind of sensitive expressive kind of level uh, I can think of something like Casal de Arman Coteau de Gomariz, perhaps you're probably familiar with those from The Flower and the Bee, which was a big hit. I think it's imported by Indigo. In, look, I've seen that in lots of English and Scottish Welsh independents. Um, and then we've got our guy here, Manuel Formigo, um, who's created uh, this wine we've got with us here today. So, Terra. So, I think. Manuel is actually here. I don't know if he wants to. I think he'd probably be better placed to explain the terroir. But um, I'll say what I think about it first of all. So I think the again the instruction, the comparison with Vigna Verde, is very apt in this case because we've got a blend here, which is built on Trechadura, which I think is the most important variety here and in Ribera, frankly. But it certainly in this wine, I think brings a wonderful um, kind of flesh, fruit, fleshy weight, if you like, to the to the blend. Um, it's also got some Lorero and some Albarino. So we're, look, we're thinking, you know, we've, this is a very similar kind of blend that you'd find in Vigna Verde. And then, so on, on the palate, for, 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 as a, this wine I think is, it's got, it's got a lovely um, kind of rich, almost exotic fruit quality. Just hints of uh, kind of, Kind of herbiness, so it's kind of sort of a bay leafy kind of character. Just a kind of, it's just a little, just enough of a twist of. Um, hmm. Bitterness and, all, and lots of lovely fleshy fruit on the palate, great length, immaculate balance, silky texture. I think that's a, I think that's a seriously lovely wine, actually. Um, it's a single vineyard. Um, I think the, the wines, the Trechadura wines, at least, are 40 years old. Um, there's a little bit, I should say, of Albia in there as well. Um, and, I, and I just think it, it's, it's a brilliant expression of what um, modern Galicia yeah, and certainly modern Ribeiro can do. Um, does Mesmond? How does everyone feel about Terra? Yeah. 
It's almost got a kind of Gewurz type quality about it as well. Yeah, it's got it's that got kind of absolutely. It's got that lovely kind of. It's a, yeah, an Alsace like weight, fruit weight. Yeah. Mm. Yes, it definitely. It's got a, it, it doesn't seem to resemble, you know, an Albarino from Rias Baixas at all, does it? I mean, it's got that. It no. seems like it's, it's got that kind of freshness and maybe that slight salinity you might associate with, you know, that environment. But it, it to me, I, I would I'll probably have confused it with something with at least Gewurz in the mix. Mm. Yeah, it's a. I, I, yeah, I, I suppose if I'm thinking of, um, that's why I would sort of head south of the south of the border rather than across sort of uh, towards the sea. Um, in terms of the comparison, definitely, it's definitely. I definitely feel like it's got a kinship with modern, some of the more modern Portuguese white winemakers. Definitely, yeah. Excellent. And what's the? Sorry again. What's the price on that one? I don't. Deliciously refreshing as well. Definitely. Sorry, um, and we, and it's, yeah. it's, again, this is one without an importer. I think this is eight euros from memory. Oh, that's, that's fabulous. I mean, it's it's just such a it's a serious wine. That's what's. It's a really serious wine, and at that price, I think that's that's really good. I think I, he um, they sent me a few other wines that the same people there. It's a family family uh, a very small family winery, um, and just to see what I mean, what they they say that I really liked what they said. I liked their attitude, which I think some sums up some of what I'm saying about Spain, which is we try to work in line with the vines, doing what they want and not what we want. It's a nice way of looking at winemaking. Um, so this is a single, as I said, it's a single vineyard, and um, they're like, like they're in the village of Bayade in the Avia Valley, in the Dio Ribera. Lovely. So really, so, real. That's a real nice discovery for me in that wine. Yeah, really, really good. So uh, some comments there in case someone hasn't got the, the chat function open. Brad Horn says fantastic length and weight, a nice saline edge, and Alan Wright says deliciously refreshing. I think um, that's almost a curry wine for me, David. Do you think? Yeah, why not? Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I sort of um, maybe a kind of curry, like a sort of go and fish type thing, <laughs> something like that, or it's or a, or a Thai even. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Not one of our cheap back curries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Tikka masala. Um, okay, now we're going to go uh, kind of due. You know, we're going to head due southeast, so we're going from the northwest to the south east of Spain. Now this is another area where, you know, it's really raised its game in the past 20 years in the manner I've been going on about. Um, so again, I think that probably the prime example of what's going on in southeastern Spain in terms of uh, revival and renaissance and reappraisal is, is, is perhaps the great variety Bobao, um, which was, which was such a workhorse variety for years um, and probably still is in a lot of the wines we see, but in places in Utia Riquena, Manchuela, um, Valencia, it's the, you know, there, there's some serious winemakers, so Bodegas Mustaguillo, or Juan Antonio Ponce, or Bruno Marciano, making really, um, really interesting wines from, from Bobao, the, the red grape variety, with a kind of tangy edge to them, but, and a freshness, um, really kind of like, not, not like anything else, really. Um, also down in the south, East, you've got you know these really brooding, deep flavoured um, monastrel, so made from monastrel, which is basically Morvedra, um, in dios like Yekla and Humilla. Um, so there's a lot going on in the southeastern part of Spain around Valencia, Alicante. Um, but the wine I've chosen to represent this part of Spain today is from really one of my favourite producers in the whole country. And I think one of the best value fine fine wine, def, really fine wine estates in the world. So it's um, I think it's someone who's often it's the winemaker who's really important as much as you know as much as we go on about to while. But this the the guy behind Sierra del Rura is um, uh, a guy called Pablo Calatayud, who's also very been very important in the renaissance of of Bobao. Um, but he's got all kinds of things on the go. He's one of those people who's just full of ideas. He's interested in everything and anything. Um, in terms of wine, he loves working with all the other local grape varieties. Um, so in, in the wine we're about to try, if I just bring over Safra, um, is uh, Mando, um, which is a local variety. I think you find it also up in Catalonia near Barcelona in Pla de Vages, and I think apparently it's found in Bierno, 
um, but there's not a great deal of information about it. Um, he also works with a variety called Mesaguera White, which is a white wine, white variety, and he does um, he does have you know he does have some international varieties as well, and he makes his wines in kind of two distinct camps. One he calls I think classic, which is basically 20th century as he says winemaking. Um, so you know you're kind of French one, yes, but you're kind of traditional Bordeauxish, Burgundy type oak barrel, simple maceration, that kind of thing. The other is something the at Stalin calls he he thinks of as modern, but it's modern ancient. So it's 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 one where you've revived old techniques. So kind of a very limited um, hands off viticulture and 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 winemaking and use of uh, clay vessels or tinajas. Um, and you know he's uh, he just makes these really distinctive but beautifully fluent and fluid wines that that really stand out for me. Um, so he's he's got vineyards around uh, Moschent in Valencia. So it's a little bit you know, there's a lot of orange groves around Valencia, and uh, where he's based is slightly cooler than that. So it's too cold for oranges really, but it's just right for kind of balancing, producing balanced, uh, elegant wines. Um, so yeah, he says he describes it. Pablo describes this wine as. Um, yeah, it's an interesting colour. I'm just said the interesting colour. Yeah, it's, it's it's like a sort of it's so bright, isn't it? And vibrant. Um, he describes it as more as behaving like a white wine. So I like that. I mean, it's it's got very little in the way of uh, sulphur additions. I mean, it's not. I don't think he'd ever describe himself as a natural winemaker. He doesn't describe himself as a natural winemaker. But what he does say is that there's you know he likes to have as little sulphur as possible um, and as little. In the way of additions in it of any sort so you've got um yeah i mean this is just it's just such a lovely bright fluent wine just a little tinge of spice and uh kind of greedy herb mm. just that little pleasing kind of seasoning of pepper tannins are lovely just enough tannin to keep you interested, um, but they're very kind of they're just a little bit dusty, chalky, um, which makes it great with food. But this is a I think the modern parlance is smashable. I don't like using that word really, but I think that's where it fits in. But it's a bit more than that, isn't it? It's just just got a little bit more to it than that. And I just really love the aromas. To me, it seems really um, uh, redolent of uh, Mediterranean and uh, kind of like you can sort of imagine walking through. Oh, sorry. <laughs> kind of walking through a kind of uh, Mediterranean forest. It's really lovely wine. I, I don't know if I'd, I'd call it smashable because it's it's got that kind of grit to it as it goes down, doesn't it? It's, it's mm. got a real texture to it, as you say. That mm. chalky tanning is probably quite a good way of putting it. What what's the oak on that? Hmm. Sorry, it's um. Well, it's 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 um. What's it called? Uh, amphora or tinacas? So um, clay amphora. So it's been fermented in that. And I think that gives it yeah, a good question. <laughs> yeah. I think it means drinkable. I think in the old old parlance it would be gluggable, wouldn't it? Or glue glue. Is that another one that people use these days? Maybe? I think yeah. quaffable has been banned by a lot of people. People don't like quaffable. Yeah, that's why. So people have been starting to use smashable instead. Not smashable is bad. Say. Much worse. It is, isn't it? It's horrible. Reminds me of those two horrible football commentators. Anyway, <laughs> draw a veil over that. Uh, anyway, I think that's a really beautiful Mediterranean wine uh, that that should um, that I, I just I think it's uh, excellent, and, and it would keep, I think it will it will probably keep actually as well. There's enough there, enough in in it to kind of uh, age. I was just looking okay. at the, the price, David. So that that one's mm. um, that 17, uh, Alliance, that part of Alliance that one, and that's seventeen ninety nine RRP. See, I think that's brilliant. I really do. I'd, I'd be so happy to. I, I really would be. Happy to buy that for that price. Yeah. Um, so These are hand selling, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I'll try and do that. What's everyone think? Did, 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 what do other people think? Intriguing. Anyone to type any, any comments? We, the, any any comments you have on any of the wines? Feel free to type them at any point in the in the conversation on the chat. For those who maybe missed the beginning, if you're wondering what Dave is referring to, or you're wondering where they're getting these comments from, it, it's the uh, purple button in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. If you click on that, then the, the chat function will open. And you can type comments at any point or ask a question or whatever you want to do. 
Yeah, that's right. It is. It has had a juicy primary Fuji quality, definitely. Mm. Excellent. Okay, we'll move up the coast a bit now, up the towards uh, kind of my patch. So I'm I'm living in. Uh, yes, I believe he does. Yeah, and in answer to the question of does he vilify the, the varieties together, I believe he does in this instance. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go up the coast now to further north. So actually, I mean Valencia and Catalonia have a lot in common. I mean, a lot of the Catalans would say that Valencia is part of Catalonia, really. The, Cat the Valencians may not have quite the same view on that, but I think there's we'll probably see something of a a, a common a commonality at least between the next two wines, although the next the, sorry between this wine and the previous wine. Um, so we're going up. We're going up to the very kind of north, north uh, eastern corner of Spain, um, to the Emporada, which is um, so it's in Catalonia. And Catalonia, I suppose, most people when you, we think of, uh, or traditionally, I mean, as a country within a country, if you like, Catalonia's equivalent of Rioja might be Penedès, where you have the Torres family, and also Carva is mostly, I think, ninety odd percent. Carva is made in Penedès. Um, and then you also have like that very the very early examples of this kind of uh, wine renaissance um, using old vines and old varieties, rediscovering old vines, which was in Priorat and Monsant around, which is near Tarragona in the south of Catalonia. Um, and since you know th those two are the, so those two kind of th those areas kind of dominate or have for a long time dominated discussion of Catalonia as a wine making place, but. Recent, again, no, no, like everywhere else in Spain, you've had this uh, this explosion of the other smaller DOs, and um, so you've got places like Terra Alta, um, which is uh, which has which is great for the Garnacha Blanca, particularly also Garnacha, uh, the the red variety, um, and the one I've I've chosen just because partly at least because it's very close to where I live, is uh, from the Emporada. So. Now in the Emporada, you've had, you know, it's I suppose it's best to think of it really as a kind of uh, continuation of um, the Roussillon uh, just across the border. So um, they call that here, they call the Roussillon Catalonia Nord, so Northern, Catalo Northern Catalonia. And um, I think so, I think there's been, you know, there's definitely traditionally you had wines made from Garnacha just as you do across the border, but often made as a kind of um, traditionally as a, in a sweet style like Banyuls. Um, more recently, you've had you know, this this part of the world has been the, the center of a big kind of foodie revolution. So it's the it's the home of um, El Bouilly and El Sayed de Can Roca, both of which have been the the, the kind of restaurant, the best rest, world's best restaurant for years in a row. Um, and actually, that's had a big effect on how they've had a big influence on how the wine community has evolved in, in this part of Catalonia. So th th there's been a big influence trying to make wines which fit with the kind of cuisine that you find in, in those two restaurants and all the, the other many michelin starred restaurants you get around here, which absorbs, takes in a bit of the tradition of Catalonia, but also has kind of modern feel, I guess. So, you know, these guys, the guys behind this wine, actually they work, uh, one of them was um, uh, a sommelier at El Bui. And also the Spanish sommelier of the year, that's David Sejas, Sejas, sorry. Um, and he's partnered with a friend of his, a, a kind of architect and wine lover. And um, they make, they do this thing where they go around looking for parcels of interesting vines or wines, vines usually, uh, and make interest and make really great wines from it. So they've got they've got a wine in Penedès, they've got a wine in Galicia, uh, they've got a wine in Calatayud in in Aragon. Um, and they made this one from the Emporada. So basically, this is a blend of two plots or two sites. One of them is a kind of youngish vineyard, which is on um, the Cap de Creus um, Peninsula, which is, if you, if, if you look at um, a map of Spain, if you follow the border down from, uh, you know, from France, and then there's a little peninsula that drop, juts out. Um, and then that, that, on the southern end of that, you've got the Bay of Rosas, which is where um, El Bui was. And uh, um, so da David Seijas used to pass, uh, look, pass a kind of plot of vine, vines as he went on his way to 
to LB each day and he, he loved it. So apparently, so he, he kind of uh, managed to secure a bit of that. And he blends it with this 80 year old uh, Carignan from kind of more inland and slightly further north. Um, and, and, it's a, and I just think it's a, it's a, it's a lovely wine. I was, really, I was really quite taken with this actually. And um, I think it has some of the elements of the previous wine in, in that it's, it, it's, but it's much darker and deeper, partly because of the grape varieties involved. But it's got, I mean, what really scores for me is that it's, it's superb balance. I mean, it's, um, so you've got lovely um, kind of uh, dark berry cherry kind of flavours. And again, you've got some Mediterranean herbiness, a bit of an aniseed, I think. Lovely rich fruit. Um, but you've also got real kind of poise and a touch of freshness, which maybe is, is that element of, um, of the, the, kind of, the kind of Mediterranean influence on the vines, on the Cap de Grails, looking over the, the sea there. Mm. Yeah, good depth, lovely, lovely mouth, really good. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just the balance that gets me. Um, I think it's really beautiful wine that will keep well, but is drinking very nice now. Um, really good with food. That would be. You can see that there are people who've come at it from a food angle because because the acidity is so good. I mean, for a, you know, for a, for a wine, is it, we're talking kind of warm climate Mediterranean wine, but it's got a lovely balance. So it's full of flavour, full of full of uh, scents, full of uh, it's very evocative, but it's and it but it's not heavy or weighty or tiring. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly that. So they really well. Hannah says it's really well vinified, and the Carignan isn't overworked, which is so easy to do. It's, it's uh, yeah, it's not at all. Doesn't batter you in any way. Mm. That's a good alfresco red, I think that one, isn't it? It's a, a really good mm. wine for mm. proper spring weather when it arrives. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, it's really terrific. So that mm. one's twenty pounds. Um, from Liberty Wines, twenty pounds RRP from Liberty Wines. Oh, that's Mind good. You. Very good, yeah. Very good. No, exactly. Yeah, it does it? It doesn't have that. You don't have. Um, you do definitely get Mediterranean herbs, yes, and it doesn't feel like fourteen percent, which is a real. Which I must admit, not everything here pulls off that trick of managing not to feel heady or alcoholic, but that, but this one really does. Very good. Okay. Um, now we're going to go into the traditional, the classical, if you like, part of our tasting. Um, so, yeah, Marcus de Murrieta. So we're now going to Rioja. So now, um, Rioja, as, you're, as I'm sure you're aware, has been through a little bit of a transformation in the past few years. So you've got the, I mean, on an official level, they've, they've recognised that, you know, Rioja isn't, is, is capable of making rather is capable of making terroir wines and then you know they, they finally acknowledge that so you have the regulation in in real canal with three tiers of wine a la a la burgundy um, with a regional village and single sites um and that but that still sits alongside the the kind of uh, aging categories i suppose in much the same way that in germany you've got the sugar the sugar rank, rankings here the a peat vine um, with all the cabinet, etc. And you, but you've also got the grosser gavex, etc. There's those are great growths. Uh, and so in, in Spain, in Rioja now, you've got the, the two uh, systems in harmony, ideally, or hopefully. Um, and also, I think, I think in, in Rioja too, there's a, there's a, you know, the, the, for years, for years and years, certainly when I started getting into Rioja or into wine, there was this slightly tiresome debate between what was called uh, modernists on one hand and traditionalists on the other hand and it was all a little bit like um a bit cooked up a bit exaggerated i mean there was there was it was never as cut and dried as all that but obviously um i think as time has gone by not only has that the ideas the lessons of that kind of battle been absorbed but they've also there's there's just a just a much greater variety of Wine making styles and approaches in Rioja than there used to be, and that that there's been there's a lot of people discovering different parts of Rioja as in much the same way as people discover um, you know treating it in the same way as Burgundy and, and treating that as little as a patchwork of vineyards and and that's just all to the good. But 
um, a winery like Marques de Murieta, which is really one of the classic estates. So, you know, this is this is a, a winery with a history going back to 1852. So, you know, we're really talking about, the, you know, one of the first, I think they even claim to be the first wine to have Rioja on the label. I'm not sure if I'm honest with you how, how true that is. Um, but um, they are, w without any doubt, any, any doubt, one of the, the great grand names of uh, first growths, I guess, of... Um, of uh, Rioja wine, and um, I mean the, the interesting thing is that they were founded on a kind of the, the kind of chateau concept, the sort of Bordeaux chateau concept. So you've got this is the this wine in particular, this Reserva, is all sourced from the Egai estate. So this isn't like you know a lot of Rioja even today, and I don't have a problem with this if it's if the wine's good, but a lot of Rioja is sourced from different growers. You know, it's it's a, it's a, that that's the model, like a Champagne. But this wine has always been, this wine is sourced from a, a producer which has 300 hectares of his own vineyards, uh, which surround the winery, and that's in the, the sort of the, in the southern, well, the, the most southern, in fact, most southern tip of uh, Rioja Alta. Um, wines which incidentally, the vineyard is about 300 to 485 metres above sea level. I mean, and the, the, the people themselves behind this, so the Marcus and Murrieta, uh, Bodega, the, the 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 guys there, they they you know as as many people do, uh, they say this is the best. This is where tradition meets modern, uh, and that's a bit of a cliche, honestly. And you know, most the as a wine journalist, you kind of got a little bit tired of that idea, perhaps. I don't know about you, uh, Graham, <laughs> but um, I, I think you know if if that was ever true, I think this would be true here because what you have in this wine, I think, is is the best of. Of kind of old Rioja method, so you know we've got the Reserva recipe in a way. You know you've got that classic uh, American oak used and new, and you've aged it for four years, a mix you know between barrel and bottle. Uh, but what you've got with that is the most immaculate fruit. So sometimes in Rioja and in the past, or in Spain more generally, honestly, sometimes you have that sense of um, the oak being used as a as a as cosmetic, you know, it's covering things up. Uh, but in this case, you've got a real perfect harmony of um, that kind of technique, the kind of um, the Rioja way, the, the classic Rioja bodega um, recipe model, whatever you like to call it, um, in harmony with some really beautifully integrated, thank you for that word, Brad, um, fruit. Yeah, it's, it's um, I, I just think it's uh, exactly what I want from a Rioja, Rioja Reserva. So it's, You've got you've got the fruit flavors. You've still you've got some lovely still primary fruit, but you've also got the the things that I really want in a Rioja of a, of a let's say a more classical styled Rioja at least, which is that savory element, and it's just just feels so kind of harmonious, mellow. It just makes you want to kind of it's just kind of a comfortable experience. It's just like sitting in a really comfortable armchair, you know, like a nice leather armchair, or whatever. You just really kind of cozy, relaxing wine, but with a beautiful integration of fruit, acidity, and and oak. And you know, and, you know, working with oak is a skill. And when you get it right, you know, you understand why uh, wine has been made in oak for all this time and why you know why it works. Obviously, sometimes oak has gets a bit of a you know get, oak has got a bad reputation thanks to the excesses of you know the the park era, I guess. But, but, you know, when you taste a wine like this, you realise uh, that's a skill, that's an art, making wine with oak. And I think it's uh, really, really well done. I think that um, expertise with oak is becoming more kind of prevalent now in, in Rioja. I mean, given, given that their market is not just the UK and not just people with, you know, tastes like yours, they're, they're people mm. around the world who are used to Rioja being a certain way. I mean, how, mm. how big is this? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I, th I think... Um, I think there's so many different styles available in Morocco now. So you can get you can get wines which are really kind of juicy, young and fresh, not dissimilar really to the maybe not as to the extent of the the wine La Safra from Valencia, but you can certainly get um, wines of a similar style to the Rocca del Crete um, in in Rioja these days. And you and you'll get wines which are made from purely from Garnacha, you know, which are much more which have a kind of silky, red-fruited style to them, almost Pinot-like, some of them. You get wines from very high altitude, which, which again, have a different style. And then, but there's still space for these, for the, the kind of the more traditional style. 
and and also you've still got and you've got wines like for example um Roda Bodegas Roda or Contino which are much more which are quite slick and modern in some ways you know but they're still beautiful wines I think as long as the, the style's well made I think there's a market for it everywhere and I don't I don't think um I don't think the world wants or lacks for um that you know very traditional style and I think there's enough of it still being made to, to please people who still like that mm. This, this has gone down well if you can see the, the notes on, yeah, the, on the right. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a terrific Tinted, wine. fresh wild strawberry and delicate oak, so layered. Mm. Jonathan says, wine of the tasting, delicious. I, w I was talking to, um, you, you'll see it in the next issue of the Wine Merchant magazine, we've done an interview with Moreno Wines, which of course is part mm. of the Boutique group now and um, built its whole mm. reputation on Spanish wines. And the team there, you know, they've got a young new team in there. And their view is that, you know, they go all across Spain looking for interesting stuff. And they're mm. very excited by things at all corners of Spain. But when, when asked, I pinned them down and said, which region in particular is exciting the most? They said Rioja, mm. which really mm. surprised me. But you're kind of mm. shedding some light on that. Mm. Yeah, no, I think I think that's... That I, I, I mean, I've been there a few times in the past couple of years. And, and, and the change from the first time I went, which must be about 20 odd years ago now, um, it's just it's enormous. It really is. There's so much going on there. And uh, I think the Rioja we get in 20 years' time will be... Again, just completely different. Uh, I just, I, it's, 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 a bit, it's a genuinely exciting time there, I think. Mm. The issues with climate change, though, like everywhere. Yeah, but I suppose they do have, they do have altitude at, at their disposal in places. So I suppose yeah. that is a mitigating factor. I think that the switch to Garnacha also is helping. Like people are using a lot more Garnacha. Yeah. Excuse me, and, and uh, Graciana. So yeah, it's uh, interesting times. Yeah. Okay. So that one um, is from MMD and the RRP is £25 on that one, I believe, yeah. Okay, so another classic to finish with. Oi, an interesting... So we got, I think, I, I actually, to be honest with you, I would have, I did hum and haw slightly about doing this wine first because sorry, I do think of uh, Manthania, Pinot, but particularly Manthania as a white wine, really. I mean, in fact, I was I did a did an interview with Peter Sisek recently, who's like the the guy behind um, Pingus, the uh, kind of cult wine from Ribera del Duero. So he's like a, he's a Danish guy. He's he's you know, an important winemaker in Spain. He said you know he wanted he's been for years for thirty years he's been trying to make a white wine in Spain, and he said well actually in the end he realised that Spain's great gift to the world in terms of white wine was um, was man was Manthania, or for, sorry, for, was was uh, sherry was dried Pinot and Manthania sherry, and he said, you know, he, he's, you know, it's limestone. It's it's um, so he's actually making a sherry now, a dry uh, sherry, and he it does taste. I mean, it, it does really have elements of um, of a uh, of great white burgundy. It's really interesting. So I, I did hesitate and hum and ha about putting this on first, but I know a lot of people struggle sometimes when I've done tastings to taste. Uh, other wines after tasting a sherry, so I've, I've left it till the end. But I think this is a lovely example of Manzanilla. It's a nice way to finish as well, in a, in a, in a way. Um, <coughs> it's a, it's quite interesting. It's got quite an interesting story because I suppose there's a kind of quite a lot of the history of sherry in here because um, so it's quite confusing in some ways. But this is a it's basically it's it's the work of three bodegas. <laughs> so first of all, you've got Pedro de Mec, which is a big, big name, a legendary name in a way behind uh, brands like La Ina, Bottaina, Cappuccino, etc., um, and plenty of brandies as well. And they were they were bought by um, Allied Lions in the 90s, in 94, something like that, and then bought by Pernod Ricard. And then so some of the brands in the original Pedro de Mec portfolio were sold off, and they went to either Lustau. Or to Osborne, um, and then the brand, of, but the brand Demek itself uh, was left to, or was, was went up to, ended up with uh, Gonzalez Bias, and so they they brought out, they actually got the brand name, and they are responsible for this one, which is apparently brand new, Demek Demek Manzanilla, um, and it's actually aged at the Delgado Zuleta in, or I should say in Spanish proper pronunciation, Delgado Zuleta in San Lucar. So that's three producers for one wine, which is quite interesting. And, and it's kind of, um, it kind of shows how much 
you know, Sherry again is changing. I mean, it's obviously it's slightly. I think it's slightly slower. It's slightly more difficult for the for Sherry than it is in Rioja. Um, they've got to deal with. Uh, they've still got to deal with a lot of baggage to do with Sherry. Um, it's still getting that sense of it being a wine rather than a kind of than a fortified. Anyway, it is a fortified wine, but you know they've still got to get over that feeling that you know fortified wines are heavy and difficult, and you know it's not what you want to drink on a hot summer's day. Or you know th th there's a lot of baggage with sherry still, and, and maybe not for us in the trade. But I think you know in 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 Jerez, in San Lucar, in the Sherry Triangle, you know things are moving forward. There are these interesting boutique producers, some of the bigger producers like Gonzalez Pius. The Gonzalez Pius portfolio, when you look at it, it's, it's really, it's full of some really fabulous wines. I mean, we talk about small producers. They're a massive producer in many ways, but the, the sherry portfolio anyway, it's just incredible really, when you, when you look at all the different styles and, and the, the, the quality they maintain, even on big brands like Tia Pepe, um, is really very impressive in my view. And, and this, I, I do like this, uh, I think this is a, it's a nice, uh, nice style of Manzanilla, as someone said, you know, saline, exactly, our almonds, nice, fresh style. It's quite light, I suppose, um, but it's, it's, it's exactly what you want, I think, from a sherry of a, of a warm evening in Andalusia. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering what proportion of all Fino and Manzanilla sales in the UK mm. are within the trade itself? Maybe? From the trade to the trade, oh, it, it yeah. just seems like it's a, a style that has never quite had that breakthrough, and I don't really understand why. Mm, mm. Yeah, I don't either. I, I mean, because um, even when I when I started when I started working for the Observer, the the guy who employed me said, um, right, you're not allowed to write about these. There's three articles that were banned, and they're actually almost into the point in his own little personal style guide. And he said one of them was, uh, you can't write about the Riesling revival. And you can't write about the sherry revival because with that's just you know and so it goes you know it goes just get for years people have been writing the article you know when will sherry become back again and and you know I, it's uh, it's hard to say isn't it I just think people just struggle with the idea of of the I think it might I mean these days it might be to do with the alcohol but then vermouth is people are happy with vermouth these days aren't they I don't know. Yeah, even that is it's still a bit of a niche, though. And I, I guess that's that's a kind of a cult thing in certain maybe more metropolitan areas. I think with yeah. um, Fino and Anthonia, it, it just hasn't hasn't caught fire for whatever reason. I, I think maybe it's it's the drinking occasion that, that flummoxes people mm. because people don't tend to kind of, or the, uh, the majority of drinkers, I would suggest, don't tend to kind of move through different styles through a meal. They'll they'll plonk a few bottles down, and, and that's what will keep them going all the way through. In in many cases, mm. I would suggest. Mm, mm. And there isn't that Anthony moment. And if there was, are you going to go and buy a whole bottle? But that said, this is 1075 RRP, which looks like a, a, a typo the more you look at it. I mean, it's just mm. a crazy cheap price. Well, I'm right. sure it was 10, 15 years ago. Exactly. And that's sherry all over, isn't it? I mean, the price, the, the value you're getting for the. But I mean, if, if wine was priced on the, the kind of um, principle of uh, the, the, the kind of labor and the, the kind of stock holding. That, that goes into it. Um, so the co actually the actual cost of producing it, then then sherry is insanely uh, bargain bargainous. But you think well, you, should, you should probably um, use that. You should sell the um, that Manthony a moment as your to the to the sherry people as a. As a I'm, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to get some tattoos done that people can put on their arms and, and things like that. <laughs> so Alan Wright says this is what Manthony is, is supposed to taste like, um, and yeah, Brad say maybe bars add tonic, yeah. Yeah, there's a there was a there's what is it, they call it a rebujito, I think, which is uh, basically cheap <laughs> cheap lemonade. There's a brand here called Casera, which is all cheap lemonade. It's, it's not even lemonade; it's just all sweet, fizzy water and uh, and manzanilla, which they drink, you know, quite a lot of. But yes, I mean that that, that is a good idea. Tonic's much much better as a mixer, and uh, yeah, well, that's been the white port kind of success story in many ways, isn't it? Just the, mm. The I mean, the last time I was in Jerez and, and Manzanilla country, um, San Lucar, it looked like, or it sounded like to me, that a lot of people were kind of giving up on their vineyards and the vineyard area was continuing to shrink. Mm. I don't know whether that's a trend that you're aware of or whether there's any kind of... Yeah, no, that's sadly point. true. Yeah, I mean, and, and there's, been, there's been various efforts to kind of talk up. The, I mean, that's, that's, maybe that's one of the problems is that they, they, they broke the link between vineyard and wine. And repairing that link is very difficult if you're not talking about your vineyards. So there has been some attempt to kind of 
talk about the terroir of sherry, but not enough, I think. Um, yeah. Hmm. Well, no, I think, like you say, the story was always about the, the the big sherry revival. Now the story is kind of what happened to the sherry revival and why didn't why didn't happen? <laughs> and then there'll be another story talking about that story. So yeah, I, it just seems, seems like we're around in circles, and it's immensely frustrating. But I mean, just thinking in, in about myself and my circle of friends and family, to me, this is crack cocaine. I mean, I I, I very rarely have it in the house because I just can't stop myself drinking. I find it so addictive. And I love it. Yeah. But I've I never won. I've never converted yeah. anybody. My conv conversion rate in 25, 30 years is zero. I've never <laughs> done it. So, you know, that's really trying as well. I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing this half-heartedly. I'm really going for it. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody in the audience um, do, do all right with Sherry? Do you have anybody uh, here to be take some, any time to tell it? It'd be good to get some thoughts on it. I, I know talking to various independents around the country, it's very interesting when you talk to people about Sherry, and I often find really, myself doing it. Chris, some Chris people, point, sorry. It's really interesting. Chris, Chris Connolly is saying that, um, you know, his price, uh, for our list from the 50s have Tio Pepe and second growth Bordeaux priced at the same <laughs> level. Amazing that. Yeah. And look, look what happened I there. Think. I mean, hmm. but I, I think in many cases, and I don't wish to disparage anybody, I think sometimes it, it comes down to the enthusiasm of the individual merchant. And hmm. there are some places where I've been to where they, you say, have you got any sherry? And they say, no, people around here just don't like it. Hmm. And, which seems improbable because you'd think that in every part of the country there'd be the same proportion of people that should like I guess it's just how much effort and time and money you want to put into convincing people it's something they should spend their money on given that it's not expensive and not making you a huge margin or you know, mm. bringing in huge revenue for you when you could be getting behind things that people do like so I suppose it's one of those conundrums. Interesting comments coming out there actually aren't there? Um, yeah I mean oh, that's good to know you have some sales in Bristol Island um, I think it's, yeah, I, I would have said, you know, that would have been one of my things, like what Keith is saying, you know, half bottle, I'd have thought that would go down really nicely. Because I, I think it's packaged nicely as well. Maybe that's just a personal aesthetic thing, but it's funny at Chloe, because I've never been able to enjoy it. So, yeah, it's uh, so good luck anyway with your diploma, Chloe. Hmm. Russell is um, just as unsuccessful as I am by the sound of it in converting people. <laughs> but he has even tried to pay people. So yeah. He's gone even further. <laughs> I, don't know what we should do. I thought this was interesting because I didn't chill this one as much as I normally chill my, my Manthamere. Mm, mm. And I, I must admit, I've fallen into the trap recently. We must wrap up in a second looking at the time. Mm. I, I sometimes probably serve mine far too cold, if I'm honest. Mm. It's normally a hot day and it's mm. an aperitif and I'll probably overchill it. This one is a little bit warmer and I'm getting more nuances from it because I was, I was mm. part of me was wondering how much variation there really was on the spectrum of, of styles. Mm. But, uh, this this probably gives me something different to what I'm used to. Mm. Yeah, Keith is drinking all of his, so he's not, yeah. he's not worried about some people. <laughs> Brad's record is one in 150, so yeah, it's all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. <laughs> well, it's weird because actually, even up here in uh, in Spain, so they don't nobody drinks sherry up here in Catalonia. Nobody. It's, is that uh, it's very, uh, may, Maybe, but it's very hard to. It's even quite hard to buy it. You know. If they'd have one or two, There's, the, the range is less than it would be in a British supermarket. You don't so, see it in Barcelona particularly, do you? I noticed that. No, one, no, no, no. It's too cold, the English mistakes, says Russell. And perhaps serving it with the right food or as a pairing flight will increase the hit rate of converts. You know what, I've, of, I've often thought, and if I ran a restaurant, mm. I'd probably go bankrupt very quickly, but my big idea for running a restaurant is that when people come in, you, they're, they're in a happy mood, they, they're in the mood to be, they're quite pliable at that point. I would go up to them and say, look, while you're choosing, I'm going to offer you a cold glass of this wine called Manthamere. And mm. if you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it, but I just want you to try it. Because I reckon mm. you can do it. Mm. Having yeah, said that, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and with, as um, NR, sorry, I'm not sure who that is, but sherry and salted almonds, if you did that as well, if you had this, if you gave them the nuts, it suddenly works, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, I love it. I can personally account for East Sussex's quote of it on my own, probably. I, mm. I may well do, for all I know. David, so I think we, um, yeah, we should. Sorry. I was just wondering if anyone, if we, if we wanted to ask everyone what their, if everyone sort of said their favourite wine just very briefly. Yes, that'd be a good I'd idea. Into the box, be quite curious. I was saying, included the sherry, sherry on wine flights, and it has more of a success rate, but still not convincing. Mm. Yeah, if anyone does have a favourite wine, it'd be good to, to hear, or even if it's not your, 
you know, it could be it can be two or three if you if you wanted. Mm. What we will do is follow up with everybody afterwards and send them a copy of the video, as I said, and um, any other links that we need to share with you. You might not have had, although I think you've had everything. But at that point, if you want to feedback anything to us about um, what you thought of the, the the tasting in particular, but also Spanish wines generally, I mean. I was going to ask you, David, very quickly before we wrap up. Mm. I mean, you haven't been to the UK very much in the last year for obvious reasons, but no. from, from your memory of what lists are looking like and what you know about it as, as your work as an award-winning mm. jazz with the, was it Bexhill Observer you said you worked for? That's the one, yeah. Uh, yeah, that one. Um, I mean, do you think that we get a representative range in this country that would be, you know, that does, does Spain proud or are there gaps? Where, where, and if there are gaps, where are those gaps? Yeah, it's a good question, actually. I, I think... Um, I think it kind of goes in and out. Sometimes it also depends. I think I think like with a lot of these things, certain um, importers have enthusiasms, and then they don't always last. So I think I think there's a very there's very I think certainly being in Catalonia, there's a there's a dearth of, of the, some of the really interesting stuff that's being made here in England for sure. Um, I think uh, the, the you know the, I didn't manage to fit a wine in from. Uh, the Gredos Mountains in the center of Spain. So one of these garnaches that are being made there, I've noticed that well, I've noticed that when I have shown those wines to people in England, they don't get it. And I think that's because there's a dearth of there's some really interesting wine being made from garnacha in uh, Spain, and a lot of the interesting stuff isn't is very light, very uh, drinkable, very kind of fresh and pretty. And I and I don't think there's enough of it coming into Britain for people to even get a handle on the fact that if that, that is gone actually, it's, they still think it should be, uh, you know, kind of boisterous and uh, almost soupy and sort of big fruit, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, those wines, but yeah, I, th I think, I, I mean, it, it's, it's obviously, it changes from region to region, retailer to retailer. I think Indigo are brilliant. I really do. I think they, they do a brilliant job. I think Alliance also has a superb list. And um, I've been noticing that Spain, the Spanish, Liberty Spanish list has really improved a lot as well in recent years. And so, you know, a lot of the times that will have a knock on effect if, if, if people stick, if those importers are prepared to stick with them. We should probably just point out that before we wrap up again, that that's a link you might need. If, if you want to take part in any of the digital tastings, the two digital tastings that wines from Spain are running, that link again is www, obviously, foods, wines, from spain.com so that's food with an s wine with an s from spain.com so that's for the two digital tastings that's also for the two uh, remaining master classes or is there three more i think there's two more one with tim atkin one with jamie good um not as good as david obviously but you know they're learning their craft you've got to support these young upcoming wine writers haven't you so you know <laughs> share the love around people but i think we've probably let people go don't you think because we've we've mm. used up their hour we could probably do another hour just chit chatting about spain generally because there's so much going on isn't there and we could probably do mm. several more of these and choose you know, another six, 12, 18, whatever wines, couldn't we? Because uh, there's, yeah. there's no end. Yeah, okay, very, everyone. Very thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks well done. Thank you for your comments. Yes, we'll mm -hmm. see you again soon, no doubt.